Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is Dublin 1303, The Business of War. In this podcast, we will delve deep behind the scenes of medieval warfare in a story of a group of people often forgotten, that is, the labourers and officials who had to undertake what now seem as strange, unusual and often chaotic preparations to get a medieval army to the battlefield. We will also encounter the chaos this caused for people in the early 14th century. In the high summer of 1303, medieval Dublin was flooded with soldiers and sailors. The bay to the east of the city and the neighbouring port of Dawkey were full of ships. The city itself was not in danger or facing war. The army amassing was destined for Scotland. The previous year, the king... Edward I, known to many today as Edward Longshanks, had practically begged the Earl of Ulster, Richard de Burgh, to bring a force to Scotland to aid the ongoing war there. De Burgh had acquiesced, and in Dublin in the summer of 1303 he gathered an impressive force consisting of knights, hundreds of squires, 500 light horse called hobblers, and thousands of foot soldiers. Before he left Dublin, he held a lavish ceremony in the great fortress of the medieval city, where he raised 33 of his followers to knighthood. However, while these celebrations occupy those in the great hall of Dublin Castle, in the city and the surrounding hinterland, many were busy toiling away to prepare de Burgh's army to ship out. Through the summer of 1303, officials and planners had been busy solving one problem after another. Transporting 3,500 men and their equipment was no easy task in the medieval world. The first major problem they had had to solve was finding a fleet that could carry them. In the early 14th century, there was nothing akin to the large 20th century troop transporters. Although there were oared galleys, by far the most common ship was a vessel called the Cog, which was used in both war and trade alike. Now the cog by modern standards was tiny, measuring only 25 to 30 metres in length. With the small space below the decks taken up with cargo holds, there was no cabins or the like. Travelling across the Irish Sea in cogs, while it was a daily occurrence in the early 14th century, was a risky business. In heavy rolling seas, cogs can only have been like a roller coaster as they were tossed around with waves sweeping across the decks. Being washed overboard was a very real possibility. A sea passage where you were just violently seasick must have been considered lucky. Nonetheless, it was these ships that de Burgh's army would have to use. However, for the officials tasked with amassing the fleet, getting their hands in the ships was another matter entirely. During this era, there was no royal or military fleet to speak of. So, to transport de Burgh's army, royal officials called purveyors seize what cogs were available in Irish waters using extensive powers granted to them by the king. The task to do this in 1303 fell to a man called Alexander de Bicknor, a future Archbishop of Dublin. In this work he was aided by the Sheriff of Waterford, Morris Russell, and they moved from port to port around Ireland, literally impounding what suitable ships they could find. For the ship owners, they could not refuse. This was akin to national service. Although they were supposed to be paid the going rate, this usually took the form of a promise of payment in the future, which could be years in coming. So this seizing of ships naturally created tensions. It's easy to imagine the fate of a ship owner who was struggling to make ends meet when a purveyor arrived in a port, impounded his ship and his crew and forced them to work for the promise of money in the future. No doubt this bankrupted many. Although there is no record of tensions in 1303, it's little surprise that in 1311 we find the mariner Thomas Le White hiring six sailors to murder the royal purveyor Robert Thursdain, an incident which most likely stemmed from Thursdain's job. In 1303, despite the extensive powers at their disposal, it was clear that royal purveyors in Ireland, no matter what methods they used, would come up short. But on this occasion, the king, being desperate to get de Burgh to Scotland, stepped in and sent a fleet of cogs from England to Ireland. However, it was really only once the fleet and army were assembled in Ireland that the headaches for the planners, officials 
and indeed Dubliners alike, really began. By the high summer of 1303, the purveyors had successfully assembled a fleet of cogs in Dublin. The bay, the city's port and the neighbouring port of Dawkey were crammed with 173 ships. In the end, only 37 of these had been found in Ireland, the rest having travelled from England. At the same time, large numbers of troops had begun to arrive in the vicinity of the city as well. The arrival of soldiers and sailors in medieval towns was a source of great tension. Soldiers had a notorious reputation for rowdy behaviour. Indeed, only two years previously, a riot had occurred in Drogheda when the townspeople had tried to stop the soldiers of Piers de Birmingham entering the town. This saw several soldiers killed and many others badly beaten, while a woman present had miscarried. Sailors were not much better. In New Ross, one of Ireland's leading ports in the early 14th century, a fracas broke out in 1305 between the town's mayor, Robert Signed, and sailors from England. Despite such potentially explosive tensions in the city, the planners still had weeks of work ahead of them. The ships had to be repaired, fitted out and loaded before the army could head for Scotland. The key logistical issue was not the transport of the soldiers or their food or supplies. That was relatively straightforward work done on a daily basis in busy ports like Dublin or Dawkey. However, there was one particular cargo that was extremely valuable but very difficult to transport. This was the war horses. War horses, which carried mounted knights, were the equivalent of tanks in the medieval world. They would be the force that had the potential to punch through enemy lines on the battlefield. However, war horses took years to train and were hugely expensive. It was not possible for the army to turn up in Scotland and hope they could rob the first horse they came across. Instead, these highly bred horses had to be shipped from Ireland. Transporting these animals was a dangerous business. They could not be allowed to simply stroll the deck. While they were trained to keep calm amid the chaos of the battlefield, keeping a horse calm in heavy seas or even a mild swell on a tiny ship like a cog was an entirely different matter. If the horses bolted on the tiny ships, they would cause horrendous damage to the crew, soldiers and could easily fatally damage themselves. Now this could not be allowed to happen. Almost everything else, including humans, could be replaced easier than war horses. The medieval world had a solution to this problem, but the fitting out of the fleet with the necessary pens and cages to hold the horses was a major operation. It was during that summer then in 1303 that work parties fanned out across the forests of the wider Dublin region to cut down flexible saplings which would be used to make pens for the horses. From Balgriffin in North County Dublin, as far south as the beleaguered fortress at Newcastle in eastern Wicklow, teams of labourers chopped 420 loads of saplings. We even had the name of one of those involved in this work, a William Dunning from Santry in North Dublin, who was the overseer of a work party of eight men. As the work was completed, the bundles were hauled over land, or in the case of long distances from Wicklow, they were shipped to the Augustinian Priory of All Hallows, just outside medieval Dublin. This was actually situated on the site of Trinity College today. At All Hallows, the saplings were woven together to make what were effectively prefabricated walls for horse pens. After construction, they were shipped to the cogs and linked together to form pens, and it was only then that the horses could finally be taken aboard. This crucial work took weeks, possibly even months to complete, from start to finish. Despite the fact that dozens of people were involved in heavy work for weeks, the costs were relatively tiny, a paltry £7 in all. This was unsurprising though, as medieval labourers were paid only two pence a day. These were unbelievably miserly wages, given that the Earl of Ulster, who led the expedition, had a debt of over £11,000 wiped, which was the equivalent of over two and a half million pence. When the preparations were eventually completed, the fleet set sail, and this brought Dublin's role in amassing the army to an end. In Scotland, the army did not have such great support as it did in Dublin. While they participated in military victories, their wages were paid late and they were frequently starving. Indeed, the paymaster noted, no one cares for them or their lives. Indeed, Manny had even returned to Ireland by late September, 
drawn back, no doubt, by the upcoming harvest. Of those who stayed under the Earl of Ulster, Richard de Burgh, they enjoyed further victories, including one over none other than William Wallace, the man known as Braveheart, in early 1304. While they suffered misery in Scotland, the final departure of the fleet from Dublin can only have been greeted with a sigh of relief in the city, as the thousands of armed and violent men exited the region. However, this was not the last time the city would endure such frantic preparations for naval and military expeditions. Indeed, on many occasions, officials and labourers in Dublin would provide the crucial logistical support to medieval armies, but unlike in 1303, their names, deeds and lives would be quickly forgotten. If you want to read more on this topic, I would recommend reading James Lydon's essay, Edward I, Ireland and Scotland, in the book England and Ireland in the Later Middle Ages, a key text I used in preparing this podcast. Don't forget, if you want to suggest a topic for one of these shorter podcasts, send your suggestion to irishhistorypodcast.ie or check out the podcast on Facebook or Twitter. Until next time, Sláin. Sláin.